Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is the Norman Invasion Part 14, New Blood. I hope you all had a lovely Christmas break. 2015 is going to be a busy year in terms of the podcast, but more about that later in the show. Now, however, I want to get straight into today's episode. It has been over a month since we dealt with the Norman invasion. The last show, part 13, ended in somewhat dramatic terms when the Norman knight Raymond Le Gros, on campaign in Munster, heard the following news. The Earl of Pembroke, the Lord of Strigol and Leinster, and the leader of the Norman invasion of Ireland, Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, better known as Strongbow, was dead. As you can imagine, the implications of this were far-reaching, and in this dramatic episode, we pick up the story as Raymond Le Gros found himself in a tight and somewhat dangerous spot after hearing of the death of Strongbow. When Raymond Le Gros received the news of Strongbow's death, and on occasion in this episode I will refer to Strongbow simply as the Earl, he couldn't have been in a worse position. Deep in Gaelic territory in Munster, in the southwest of Ireland, he was far from the Norman centre of power in Dublin, where the key decisions regarding the future of Norman Ireland would be made in the aftermath of the Earl's death. Indeed, even getting to Dublin was going to be difficult. No one knew how Gaelic Ireland would react when word got out that Strongbow was dead. It could easily trigger an uprising. Aside from these very real concerns, though, the news must have been a deeply personal blow to Raymond. We can only imagine the rush of emotions he must have felt. His relationship with Strongbow was far from simple. Strongbow had been a towering figure in Raymond's life. I mean, the connection between these two must have been immense. They had fought numerous battles together. They had also been side by side in Dublin during the siege of 1171, where the two had nearly starved to death. The bonds that such intense experiences inspired must have run bone deep. However, their relationship had soured in recent years. While Raymond had spent much of his life fighting for the Earl and indeed chose to attach himself to Strongbow rather than his own relations, the Fitzgeralds, he hadn't been repaid for this loyalty. In 1172, he had sought to marry Basilia, Strongbow's sister, but the Earl had refused permission. The two were only married in 1174 when Strongbow, desperate for Raymond's aid, had acquiesced. However, even worse treachery had followed this betrayal of trust. As Raymond prepared to return to Dublin in 1176 for Strongbow's funeral, he knew royal officials were waiting to take him to England to answer charges of treason. The source of these accusations was Hervey de Montmorency, Strongbow's uncle, and it appears the Earl did nothing to stop these charges going forward. Bitter or fond, Raymond de Gros needed to put these memories of Strongbow to one side for the moment at least. He needed to get to Dublin as soon as possible. His exact location when he received the news is not clear, but a few weeks earlier he had left the town of Limerick and travelled south to the Kingdom of Desmond. There he had reinstated Dermot McCarthy, a loyal Norman ally, after he had been deposed by his son. Therefore, Raymond was probably somewhere in modern County Cork. His first step was to leave the Kingdom of Desmond and return to the town of Limerick, where he could discuss the situation with the garrison there. Only after this could he return to Dublin for the funeral. On that initial journey to Limerick, Raymond would have had time to mull over his options. The key issue was what he was going to do about Limerick. Literally anything could happen when it emerged Strongbow was dead. Any of the Gaelic kings could revolt. But most of all, Donal O'Brien, the king of Thomond, whose lands surrounded the town. Indeed, it had been Donal's attack on Limerick earlier in the year that had brought Raymond so far from Dublin. While he was able to easily lift Donal's siege of the town and had forced the Gaelic king to sign a peace accord, Donal still was not to be trusted. He had attacked the Normans on two occasions in the previous six months. When word that the leader of the Norman invasion was dead got out, Donal might well see this as an opportunity to strike against the Normans again. 
Raymond, however, had one advantage. Medieval Ireland was a world without any form of communication faster than a letter or a personal messenger, and the news informing him that Strongbow was dead had been coded, so no one knew anything except him. Secrecy in this situation was obviously paramount, so Raymond told no one the news until he arrived in Limerick, and even there he only told his most trusted soldiers, with whom he deliberated over what they should do next. Norman opinion was divided into two camps. Raymond wanted to maintain a presence in the town they had fought so hard to take, even if it was surrounded by potentially hostile forces. However, he had the luxury of leaving Nimerick in a few days and would not have to remain behind to face the situation when news got out that Strongbow was dead. Those who had to stay behind were not so keen. Imagine being part of a small garrison surrounded on all sides by Don O'Brien's territory. To add to this, the Normans in Limerick were acutely aware that their overall position in Ireland could well be further weakened still. Hervey de Montmorency's accusation of treason still awaited Raymond in Dublin, as did the royal officials to take him to England. If he was taken from Ireland, the Normans would lose their best soldier. Unsurprisingly, no one wanted to be left behind in Limerick when their fellow Normans in Dublin might not have the resources to rescue them if they were besieged again. In this context, it was decided to abandon the town and return the entire garrison to Dublin. In an effort to maintain some Norman influence in the region, Raymond formally handed the town over to Don O'Brien, who since having made peace with the Normans a few weeks earlier, was technically at least a vassal of King Henry II. Nevertheless, all knew Donald's allegiance could not be trusted. He had, after all, attacked the Normans twice already in the previous few months. Indeed, as Raymond Le Gros led his soldiers from Limerick and snaked across the bridge over the River Shannon and east to Dublin, the fears of the Norman commanders about remaining behind proved justified. Before the army had even fully crossed the bridge, Donald's army was hacking away the far end while the town itself was set ablaze. No matter how galling this was, Raymond had to press on to Dublin. The journey east to the Norman capital was uneventful enough, and they arrived in the town before Strongbow's funeral took place. His fellow Normans had avoided making any announcement until Raymond had returned. According to Gerald of Wales, Strongbow's body was laid out in Dublin's Priory of the Holy Trinity, or Christ Church Cathedral as we know it today, near a bizarre holy relic reputed to be a talking crucifix. However, when Raymond finally arrived, he had been dead for several days, so his body would have already been decomposing, especially given these events took place in the high summer of 1176. No amount of strong-smelling fresh flowers or herbs could have hidden the stench at the funeral service. The passing of Strongbow was a major moment in the Norman invasion of Ireland. Not only had Raymond Le Gros mixed feelings about the Earl, but so too did many other Normans in Ireland. The man had dominated the invasion and taken the lion's share of the lands conquered at the expense of others. However, no one could deny, had it not been for his perseverance and determination, the Norman invasion of Ireland might well have floundered in the summer of 1171. The reactions to Strongbow's death in Gaelic Ireland were to an extent mixed as well, and if anything showed the increasing complexity of the invasion, which could not be simply seen as Normans versus Gaelic Irish. Each Gaelic family adopted their own policy toward the Normans. For example, Strongbow's funeral mass was celebrated by Lawrence O'Toole, the Gaelic Irish Archbishop of Dublin, while among the mourners was his wife, Aoife MacMurrah, and presumably her brother, the king of the MacMurrah family and ally of the Normans, Morkertoch MacMurrah. However, there were many more in Gaelic Ireland who welcomed his death. The Annals of Tiernoch was more representative when it recorded in 1176. Richard, Earl of Dublin, died. Since Turgesius, an early Viking, there had never come into Ireland a brigand that had wrought more ruin than him. Loved or loaded, Strongbow had unquestionably made his mark on Irish history. Even in death, he would cast a large shadow over medieval Ireland 
and the attempt to fill the power vacuum he left behind would have huge consequences. When Strongbow died, he was not only the King's representative in Ireland, but also, far and away, the biggest landowner on the island, given his territories in the Lordship of Leinster. His death, therefore, created a power vacuum, especially given his heir's age. In 1176, Strongbow's heir was his five-year-old son, Gilbert. Under Norman law, Gilbert could not inherit until he was 21, so in the meantime the family lands would be placed in the hand of the king and administered by royal officials. This now meant that most of the Norman lands in Ireland were ruled by the king and what were often indifferent officials he sent to Ireland. Such men would struggle to fill Strongbow's rather large boots. This situation presented opportunity for some, however. The extended Fitzgerald family, led by Morris Fitzgerald and whom Raymond de Gros was a prominent member, were chief among those looking to benefit from Strongbow's death. They had been in Ireland longer than any other Norman family, but had received relatively little land as the Earl had consistently sought to limit their power. Indeed, within a few weeks it seemed that they would be the ones to take over the mantle of the leading Norman family in Ireland. The royal officials who had come to Dublin late in 1176 to bring Raymond Le Gros to England to answer the charges of treason now had a change of heart. With Strongbow dead, they decided Raymond, unquestionably the best military commander in Ireland, should remain in Dublin as the king's deputy. These officials then immediately departed for England to bring news to Henry II of the recent developments. Raymond de Gros's appointment, however, signified the beginning and the end of the Fitzgerald advances in the wake of Strongbow's death. Once Henry II heard the Earl was dead, he immediately dispatched a man called William Fitzordlan to Ireland to look after affairs in the country, while he himself began to plan out the long-term future of Ireland without Strongbow. The ship that brought William Fitzordlan to Ireland initially seemed to bode well for the Fitzgeralds. The new king's representative was accompanied by three men, a little-known knight up to this point called John de Courcy, Milo de Cogan and, most importantly, Robert Fitzstephen. Robert was a senior member of the Fitzgerald family and had been one of the earliest Normans to arrive in Ireland. He had, however, been in England since 1173, but his return now meant the Fitzgeralds, led by Morris Fitzgerald, who was supported by Raymond Le Gros and now Robert Fitzstephen, were a formidable force. However, if they thought their hour had come, they were sorely mistaken. Under Henry II's instruction, William Fitzordlan replaced Raymond de Gros as the king's representative and resumed Strongbow's policy of limiting the Fitzgerald family influence. Indeed, by the time 1176 was out, things had gone from bad to worse for the family. In September, the family patriarch, Morris Fitzgerald, then in his late 60s, died. Morris had held lands in Strongbow's lordship of Leinster and now Fitzordlan, acting in Strongbow's place, stopped the strategically placed Wicklow Castle, passing to his sons. He then stripped Robert Fitzstephen of land he held around Dublin and Wexford. According to the chronicler Gerald of Wales, he only allowed the Fitzgeralds to hold on to territories which were on the frontiers with Gaelic kings and were therefore dangerous. While the Fitzgeralds castigated Fitzordon as petty and malicious, in reality he was just acting as an efficient administrator. Henry II had consistently tried to block any individual Norman lord rising up in Ireland who could become a potential threat. If you remember, in 1172, when Henry himself left Ireland, he had made Hugh de Lacy the Lord of Mead to counterbalance the power of Strongbow. In 1176, Fitzordon was just following a similar policy. With Strongbow dead and Hugh de Lacy still in England, the Fitzgeralds had the potential to become very, very powerful. While they didn't possess a lordship of their own, most of the influential Normans in Ireland did hail from this family. It's also worth remembering, only a few months earlier, Henry II had heard rumours that Raymond Le Gros and other Fitzgeralds were planning to take over Ireland in a coup of sorts. Although untrue, it's easy to see, therefore, 
why Henry II might have been suspicious about their intentions and instructed William Fitzordan to minimise their influence. After Strongbow's death, the final months of 1176 were quiet. In 1175, Henry II had brokered the Treaty of Windsor with Rory O'Connor, the King of Connacht and Ireland's most powerful figure, to stabilise the situation on the island. So in effect, Ireland had been partitioned between the two kings and Henry II had pledged to stop further conquests. William Fitzordan appears to have stuck to this agreement and the Normans did not push beyond their current conquests. However, everything changed in January 1177 when William was recalled to England and the demands from Norman warriors in Ireland for more land could not be held back any longer. Before we look at this though, I want to take a quick break. In early 1177, Ireland was a powder keg waiting to explode. Simply put, there were too many Norman adventurers in Ireland bent on conquest. The Fitzgeralds were just one of a number of young, ambitious and power-hungry nobles who were not happy with the limits set by the Treaty of Windsor. They wanted more land and were not willing to wait any longer. Among their number was a somewhat obscure knight, John de Courcy, the younger son of a noble family in England who had arrived in Dublin with William Fitzordan in the summer of 1176. In 1177, he would become the first to strike beyond the Norman borders as they stood in what would become one of the most audacious campaigns of the entire Norman conquest. While the chronology of dates is not clear, it seems to me the most likely chain of events saw William Fitzordan recalled to England in January 1177 and the ambitious nobles knew that from that moment he was a lame duck. He would leave Ireland and had no real power to stop them going to war. In this environment, the knight, John de Courcy, set his sights on Ullad, a small kingdom in the easternmost part of Ulster, and began to gather men from the Norman garrison in Dublin for what seemed like an insane mission. In the end, he found 322 soldiers willing to partake in this expedition. That these men were willing to sign up tells us much about the mentality of the Norman conquerors. Firstly, de Courcy himself was only 21. Can you imagine leading a military invasion when you were 21? On top of this, though, the mission being planned in Dublin seemed in many ways to be on the verge of suicidal. Eastern Ulster was completely isolated from all other Norman lands in Ireland. The northernmost tip of Hugh de Lacey's Lordship of Mead, the nearest Norman territory, was separated from the region by the Gaelic Kingdom of Argyllo. Unlike other conquests, like Limerick, there was no substantial walled town that de Courcy could take and use as an easily defended base. The only major settlement in the region was Down, but this was nothing compared to Dublin. Wexford or the other towns in Ireland. To make matters worse, Eastern Ulster was inside the zone of influence of the powerful O'Neill family of Western Ulster. All these factors made this a real victory or death mission. If the situation turned against de Courcy, he and his followers would be massacred. There was little hope of relief and less of escape. Nevertheless, hundreds were willing to sign up, illustrating that the Norman soldiers who were coming to Ireland were willing to risk everything for glory and the spoils of war. Crazed as this mission seems, recent research indicates that de Courcy himself was not as foolhardy as initially seems. There was some method to his madness at least. The de Courcy family appear to have owned lands in the northwest of England across the Irish Sea from eastern Ulster. In the medieval period, this sea was a communication route as much as a barrier and the de Courcy family may well have had strong links to Ulster before the young John launched the invasion. It may also explain why he specifically chose this territory which was in all other respects far from ideal. These connections with Ulster may also explain how John de Courcy managed to negotiate safe passage with Murcar the O'Carroll, the King of Argyllo, through whose territory he needed to pass to get to eastern Ulster. He was no doubt able to play on the fact that the O'Carrolls of Argyllo despised the kings of eastern Ulster and were no doubt happy to see them crushed. 
It is, however, bizarre that at this point, given the spread of the Normans through Ireland, the O'Carrolls couldn't see the disastrous implications for themselves if John de Courcy was successful. One way or another, John de Courcy and his small army arrived in the kingdom of Ullid in eastern Ulster on February 1st, 1177, where they faced an army led by Rory McAlevey, the king of the region, at Downpatrick. De Courcy routed McAlevey, but this in itself was not that surprising. The real test was yet to come. The key question was how the other Gaelic kings in the region, particularly the O'Neills, would react. If contemporary events were anything to go by though, they would not be able to find unity and ally with each other against the Normans pushing into Ulster. Indeed, when John de Courcy invaded, the major power in the region, the O'Neills, were far too busy killing each other to stop him. A century-old conflict between the two branches of the O'Neill family, the O'Neills and another faction who had adopted the name McLaughlin, was yet again breaking out into open conflict. Not long after de Courcy won his battle in February, the king of the O'Neills, A. O'Neill, nicknamed the Lazy Youth, was killed by his rival, Mwela Shocknell McLaughlin. While this feud had stopped the O'Neills intervening against de Courcy, the rise of Mwela Shocknell McLaughlin after he killed his rival spelled a long-term problem. He could now focus on problems elsewhere, such as the Normans. McLaughlin was quick to realise the threat posed by John de Courcy and he began to mobilise forces to support Rory McAlevey for a second attempt to roll back the Norman presence on his doorstep. While McLaughlin had no love for McAlevey, the King of Eastern Ulster, it was clear that he was much less of a threat than the Normans were. I guess it was better to support the devil you knew than the devil you didn't. Therefore, in June 1177, the joint forces of the Kings of Ulster marched on Downpatrick to drive out de Courcy. They were joined by the Archbishop of Armagh, one of the most important and influential clerics on the island, who brought numerous holy relics. They were faced by a force led by de Courcy in person, supported now by several hundred Gaelic mercenaries, which augmented his army to about 700 in total. The Norman chronicler Gerald of Wales exaggerated the armies of McLaughlin and McAlevey to a figure of around 15,000, but nevertheless they would have heavily outnumbered de Courcy and the Normans. The morale boost of the Archbishop and the relics, however, were no match for the determination, discipline and coal steel of John de Courcy's forces, and on June the 23rd he heavily defeated the combined forces of Ulster. This now, temporarily at least, solidified his position. The Normans had a toehold in all provinces except Connacht. However, despite what were quite remarkable achievements by the 21-year-old, John de Courcy was still dependent on things elsewhere going his way. He needed a change of policy to come from Henry II in England. He had clearly broken the Treaty of Windsor and if Henry did not change his view in Ireland, de Courcy could easily find himself isolated. However, Henry's opinions were already shifting. Since hearing of the death of Strongbow, he had decided to dramatically alter his strategy in Ireland, something that had already been outlined at Oxford in May 1177. Henry II had abandoned the Treaty of Windsor and adopted a far more aggressive stance with aims of future conquest. The policy of Henry II in Ireland, based on the 1175 Treaty of Windsor, had been unrealistic from the outset. Firstly, Rory O'Connor, who according to the treaty was going to stop Gaelic-Irish attacks on the Normans, simply did not have the power to bind other kings in Ireland to its terms. Meanwhile, as we have seen, there were too many ambitious Norman adventurers and mercenaries in Ireland to stop further conquests. This can only have been abundantly clear in 1177 when William Fitzordon reported back to Henry II when he was recalled from Ireland in January. These problems were all compounded by the death of Strongbow. In light of these developments, Henry called a major meeting on the situation at Oxford in 1177 and announced a new strategy. Among the attendees were Hugh de Lacey, the Lord of Meath, Robert Fitzstephen and Milo de Cogan, all who had spent time in Ireland. The outcome of the meeting was monumental. The Treaty of Windsor was torn up and massive portions of Ireland were doled out for new conquests. 
Firstly, the overall status of the island was changed. The aim was to bring the island more firmly under royal control. This meant curbing the power of Gaelic kings and to a lesser extent the Norman barons. This was achieved by creating initially one lordship of Ireland which, after permission was sought from the Pope, could become a kingdom under Norman rule. The regent of this future kingdom was to be Henry's then 10-year-old son, John. This boy, in time, would be none other than the infamous King John of Robin Hood fame. However, given he was only a child in 1177, he will not enter our story until 1185. This attempt to strengthen royal power was matched by land grants to Norman knights in Ireland, who Henry hoped would become loyal supporters of the young John. Unsurprisingly, Don O'Brien, the troublesome Gaelic king of Thomond, who had attacked the Normans and burned Limerick at the start of the show, had his kingdom declared forfeit. Henry then granted this to a man called Philip de Brioge, who was also present at Oxford and had been in Ireland since at least 1172. Thus, the centuries-old kingdom of Thomond, created by Brian Baru and his father, was about to become the Norman lordship of Thomond, in theory at least. The next decree from the Council of Oxford showed that the Normans had designs on the entire island and that the Gaelic Irish kings, regardless of how they acted, had little place in Henry's considerations. The Kingdom of Desmond, which covered the southern half of Munster, was taken from the McCarthy family and divided between Robert Fitzstephen and Milo de Cogan. The King of Desmond, Dermot McCarthy, had long been loyal to Henry, to the point that Raymond Le Gros had even reinstated him to power in early 1176. This no longer mattered, however. The future was just blunt conquest. Another major beneficiary at the Council of Oxford was a relatively minor Norman, Robert Le Puer. He was made royal castellan in Ireland, governor of the towns of Waterford and Wexford and also given control of a large swathe of territory roughly comprising of modern County Waterford, then in Gaelic hands. This grant to Robert Le Puer, establishing the Le Puer or Power family along the banks of the shore would see them dominate Waterford for centuries to come and in part explains the predominance of that name in the region today. Finally, in the short term at least, one of the most influential decisions was the appointment of Hugh de Lacey as Henry's new representative in Ireland. When the meeting drew to a close, all these deeds were so far only in writing, but in years to come, the ripples from the Council of Oxford would turn into tidal waves of blood in Ireland. Hugh de Lacey left and set out for his lordship of Meath, which he would settle intensively. Meanwhile, the three men granted the land of the kingdoms of Thomond and Desmond in Munster. Robert Fitzstephen, Milo de Cogan and Philip de Brioge made a compact that rather than individually conquer their new territories, they would form a joint army and help each other. They set sail for Ireland in that summer of 1177, landing in Waterford. Another wave of conquest was about to begin, which we will see in the next episode. Until next time, Slán. Slán. 